Also, check out our sportsbook reviews. We talk all the time about how important it is to have more than one out at your disposal, how important it is to be able to shop around for the best prices, the best lines, the best money lines, the best half lines, whatever the case may be. Check out that sportsbook review section. See what works for you. Can't find anything? Well, then you're not looking hard enough. But we always recommend DSI Sportsbook, where our Bang the Book Radio listeners can use the promo code BTB, the number 25, pay $25 free bet just for signing up, a 100% deposit match bonus for the sportsbook, and a 100% deposit match bonus for the live casino as well if you decide to add funds over there. So it's a great offer from our friends at DSI Sportsbook. Well, as you know, I record on Thursday evenings our Westgate Super Contest Selection segment with Sports Cheetah. Plenty of things to talk about here on today, or plenty of things that we recorded on yesterday's segment discussing the lines, the card, the differences between the traditional Super Contest and the Super Contest Gold, and then, of course, some of the challenges that are out there in the NFL betting market for Week 6. So without further ado, here is this week's Westgate Super Contest Selection segment with Sports Cheetah. All right, I'm joined now by Sports Cheetah for the Week 6 Westgate Super Contest Selection segment. Cheetah, of course, from wagertalk.com. Preston, how's it going today, man? I'm doing well. I'm sorry to hear. I know we were just talking about it before you hit record, but sorry about your Indians. I actually had a series wager on them. I had got some minus 170 on them early on before it moved up some, and I was pulling for you, honestly. So uh, I hope everything's okay over there in the uh, Adam Burke household. Yeah, you know, doing as well as we can. I mean, the the harsh reality of the fact that, you know, meaningful baseball for me is now, I mean, almost a year away because I think they still win the division next year. I mean, the regular season's cool and all, but, yeah, that's going to be the hard part now is the waiting game. And then, of course, seeing what they do in the off season to keep some of the guys around and, and all that. But that's a, a discussion for another day here. We're here to talk about the Westgate Super Contest. Plenty of things to discuss here this week. Let's go ahead and recap. What happened in week five, a three and two week for both the Bang the Book podcast entry and also bangthebook.com. My boss still holding a one game edge over me. He's 14 and 11. I'm 13 and 12. 6,419 winners, 6,541 losers, 735 pushes, 49.5% in the Super Contest last week. Super Contest gold goes 231, 204, and 30, 53.1%. On the season now, the gold, 51.93%, the traditional, 48.85%. So, Cheetah, here we are, another week with the gold, still 3.1% of the traditional Super Contest. Yeah, I mean, we've kind of predicted that, I guess, as the weeks have gone along. That's probably going to be uh, the case going forward. I, I know our, our entry in the gold, we went one and four, so we were actually one of the bad the bad entries that brought that percentage down. It was our first bad week. So looking to bounce back this week overall, um, we're still around, still in it. Nothing nothing too severe, but uh, it's always disappointing when you have a week like that after such a good start. Yeah, it really is. And, and when you look back at last week here, the consensus 6-6-1 six, six, and one in the traditional Super Contest, the Patriots and the Buccaneers with the exact same number of picks. So that will throw off the consensus count by one here, at least until we get another one of those games. Top five consensus, just one and four last week, now 10 and 15 on the season. The gold consensus, six, seven, and one, 42, 33, and two compared to 38 or 36, 38, and two, excuse me, for the traditional. So, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting when you look at how this thing is breaking down here so far. We're well ahead of last year's percentage in terms of success rate in the Super Contest. Does that surprise you with more entries? Yeah, that's a good point, actually, because I know, I think it was week one, we were even just talking about how with all the, the new entries and just such volume this year, and even though last year had a ton, uh, we kind of thought maybe we'd see a reverse where the overall percentage would, would be a little bit worse, uh, whether it's more just public square, whatever money you want to call it, or just, you know, average Joe audience trying to get in the contest. Generally, you'd expect, you know, that they wouldn't be picking as well. And that's why the gold maybe is picking almost 4% better than the traditional or the main uh, contest. So yeah, I, it is a little bit surprising. And I'd say, especially because that first week, everyone was so bad to start. And so uh, everyone's kind of gaining that ground back and uh, it'll be interesting to see how that actually finishes off. What was the percentage exactly last week? If you said it, you might've cut out for a second um, for, for last year. I apologize last year versus this year for the traditional. Do you have it on hand? Yeah, let me go ahead and pull that up here as we're talking. And, uh, you know, I, I, last year, through five weeks, 
Uh, the field was at 46.63%. So this year, 49 point, or excuse me, 48.85 percent. So a couple percentage points better, and you know we'll have to see if that is a theme that uh, that does hold true here throughout the season. All right, then also one of the things that we've been tracking here throughout the Super Contest is the consensus difference of opinion between the gold and the traditional through six weeks here, through five weeks, excuse me, in the Super Contest, 18 and 12 on the gold side. So the gold consensus, when it's different from the traditional consensus, the gold side is 18 and 12 here. Just one and two last week, Browns and Cardinals, losers, the Seahawks, a little bit of a wrong side winner there in that one for the gold consensus. So... I mean, that is something that we touched on, I think, three weeks ago. I came up with the initial count, and since then it has kind of regressed to the mean a little bit. You figure that's probably going to be the case going forward? Yeah, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, last time you did a, a number check, it, it was like it was like something like 14 and 6, and now it, it's kind of come back up, right? Yeah, I think it was about there, something like that, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there might be some. I still think there's going to be something to it overall because just seeing that they're – you know, picking 4% better than the traditional. Um, They're coming from somewhere. And, you know, it seems like a lot of the times when, especially like that week one, when everyone was struggling and the consensus picks were losing, um, there's usually, you know, the gold ones aren't doing as bad. And primarily because they're probably picking either against the consensus or using other picks that are, um, you know, just completely different to begin with. So I think there is something there to it. It's probably like before I was hitting 70%. That's not going to be the case. But I think, it could definitely be, you know, something that has a long-term, you know, slight edge in the 55% range. All right, so Cheetah, let's take an overall look here at this Week 6 card before we go into some of the games that I like. And, and of course, the biggest thing that stands out here about this week is that we've got several games that are double – well, actually, three games that are double-digit favorites, one game that's close with the Browns and Texans, another one that's close with the Jets and Patriots. This can be a really interesting week to see – you know, what the consensus looks like, see if we're laying the big numbers, see if we're taking the big numbers. How do you think all this plays out? Yeah, it's the first week. I mean, like last week, you know, I know I wasn't on and Colin uh, came on for me. And from what I heard, by the way, he did a great, a great job. So I appreciate that. He, in in that week, I mean, you guys had, it was, I think, two games that were kind of big favorites. It was the Eagles and Steelers. Then after that, every other game, was, the spread was three or less, which is just incredible. And now, like you mentioned this week, you have, you know, a 10 point, 9 point, 13 point, 10 point favorites. And so 11 points, I should say now with Washington and Denver too, 11 and a half with all the injuries from the Giants. So when you have all these games, like the complete opposite situation as we were in last week. And I'll be completely honest. I am, I'm a little bit, I find myself in a little conundrum here this week because it, usually I, I love backing some of these ugly double digit dogs and, you know, the numbers don't really suggest to, and the Giants are so depleted and so down, it's hard to back them because you just don't even know who's going to be playing. So you have to kind of throw that one out. And then my numbers actually have the Redskins higher than the 10 and a half, 11, which is out there. And so I, can't, I don't know, I can't use the Niners, even though I feel like, you know, you're supposed to or something. Uh, Miami is just a complete mess, but can you, it's, it's a really tough spot for me. And there's so many of these games now to choose from. I'm going to have to do a lot of digging, you know, towards the end of this weekend. Probably just wait for some news on some injury uh, reports. And there's a lot of guys that are questionable for Miami and for the Giants. And uh, so uh, it'll be one of those where I'm waiting until the last second. I have till Saturday morning to submit my picks. And I'll probably, you know, utilize as much time as I can to my advantage. Yeah, I think what's really hard about it is that the Falcons, the Redskins, the Broncos, double-digit favorites coming off of a bye. And we've seen the teams that are coming off of a bye all get steamed here this week, and I'm going to two of them that I mentioned on today's show. And, and that's what's so challenging is that you know not only are they double-digit favorites, and you really don't want to get into a habit of, of laying numbers like that, but they're really attractive double-digit favorites, as you were just talking about. They're coming off byes. They're playing teams that are either ravaged by injuries or in bad situational spots. It, it makes for a really tough week in the Super Contest because it goes against a lot of the conventional wisdom that we've got about betting the NFL. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's totally true. And, you know, you might end up seeing a lot of these guys that lay it that are, you'd say we're quote-unquote square, having 4-1 and one or 5-0 and oh weeks, betting a ton of these favorites. You know, like, like the Pats, you know, they've struggled. Uh, they're laying nine, or I'm not sure exactly what the contest number is on the Patriots. I'll pull that sheet up as we're talking. It is nine in the contest, too. Uh, 
it's it's you know a lot of people are going to probably lay it against the Jets and probably cover. You know the Jets should have lost to the Browns last week. They lucked into similar to that Ram Seahawks game. The Browns turned it over five times, three times inside the red zone, and got zero points out of it. And I I feel like that's going to be a popular one that covers. Like it's, it's some of these I actually do like the favorite. And I don't know. Ultimately, I might end up just trying to stay away from all these double digit games and see if I can you know somehow find and finagle five five picks out of the rest of the card. See, and I think that's an interesting point of view here to talk about for a second because we, we've talked a lot about game theory here and, and how it pertains to this contest. And that's what's hard for me to figure out is that I don't know where the field is going to go this week. I mean, if you can find an edge on Buccaneers-Cardinals, you know, I think you're going to be on a side that's not very popular here this week. If you can find an edge on Raiders-Chargers, you know, I think you're going to find a side that people aren't real comfortable with taking. So... You know, maybe taking some of those smaller numbers here to be away from what could be the popular teams may be the way to go. Yeah, and honestly, on top of that, just the fact that some of these other double-digit spread games are going to pretty high variance with, uh, I think, what we're going to get with so many question marks and stuff. I mean, even like Houston-Cleveland's another one, uh, 10, 9.5 out there. And I, I mean, the Browns, Hogan, I think, is officially the starter, so it's not going to be Kaiser now. Okay, now with the, you know a week to prep with his first team reps, that's probably I was just looking at this whole list of dogs. That's probably the, my favorite one. Uh, the Browns' defense is okay. I know they uh, there was a quote where their head coach just recently, it was either Monday or Tuesday, um, said, "Well, our defense is the fifth best in the NFL," and that was wrong. I think it was based on um, like points per game or yards per game, just like a very generic stat. But their actual yards per play, they're one of the worst in the NFL still. So I'm, I'm curious to see if Deshaun Watson keeps going off like like he has been. Um, but that's, I think, at 10 with Hogan having a full week to prep with the starters and just them having such bad variance last week against the Jets. It feels like they cover that one. So that's probably the one double-digit game I'm looking at closer than these others. But uh, other than that, I think – I think there's actually, I think tonight, you know, getting the hook, if you use the Eagles plus three and a half was a really good uh, bet. I didn't have enough time to get all these ready. I'm actually doing a bunch of NBA work this week. And I just was like, well, I could try to have the picks ready and pick Eagles three and a half. And I didn't. Um, But if you did, I think that's a good snag. I think Detroit, New Orleans offers a a pretty good um, option. So does Pittsburgh, Kansas City. And, you know, like you said, a couple of those others, if you can find a fourth or fifth one to add in there and just avoid the double digit games, then, uh, yeah, you know, I think that's probably an okay route to take or, or direction to go here this week. Well, there is one double-digit favorite I do like here this week, as we'll get into my picks and then a couple of leans that I'm looking at here. And, and this probably will end up being my five-play card, but you know, as I always talk about, and I want to throw this out there for listeners, as we get the Friday practice reports and the injury reports, I may back off of some of these games, uh, but I will never play the other side of a game that I talked about here on the show unless it's a very very extreme case where you're getting significant line value on the stale number or or some kind of thing like that but the first play i'm looking at here is i'm actually looking to lay it with atlanta they're an 11 and a half point favorite they're number seven on the super contest rotation order coming off of a buy like i mentioned which is something that i do like here we've seen some bye week steam coming in on the teams that are coming in off of a week off but the falcons 6.2 yards per play that's with a new offensive coordinator in Steve Sarkeesian. They had some extra time over the week off to get a little bit deeper into that playbook, figure some more things out. And this Dolphins offense is just so bad. 3.9 yards per play. They're better than they've played, I think. But I don't know if they can change that here this week. Also, from a scheduling standpoint, they play at the Chargers. They play at the Jets. They play in London. They come home, have their home opener against Tennessee. Got some emotion going in that game. They were a team that covered for me last week. But now they're right back on the road again, and I just think everything about this spot is terrible for Miami. Yeah, and I think that's why you've seen the number. It opened 10. I mean, it's up to 13, more like a 12 and a half uh, at Pinnacle and Chris, and it, you know that's pretty telling. Uh, as far as, as as using it in the contest, you're getting an 11 and a half, so there's actually some just kind of inherent you know stale number value there too on top of it. And I, I know um, it might be Rob Pozzola that was doing – a sheet of like net yards per play, you know, offense versus defense and, you know, more or less what your record should be or what your output should be equating to in the teams that have been, you know, more or less unlucky or lucky to this point. 
And I know the the Falcons are like his main buy on team for a team that technically is you know in a fine spot as far as their record goes and stuff. But uh, he was saying they you know the six point two on offense with Sarkeesian. I mean that's a big deal. The fact that they're actually you know moving it just as similarly as last year and effectively as last year. And defensively they've been better than like the numbers are showing. And so they're a buy on team. But it's weird. Can you buy on and lay eleven and a half points? That's ultimately what it comes down to. Um, so I'd probably decide with you. Like I mentioned, outside of Cleveland, on these double-digit dogs, uh, or excuse me, double-digit spread games, I actually like some of the favorites too. And Atlanta is definitely uh, one that I, I'm in agreement with there. And another thing too is that the Dolphins have allowed the second highest completion percentage in the NFL, and you know they've been pretty good against the run, and they were very good against the run last week against Tennessee but they're not very good against the pass. And Atlanta has a very balanced offense, but if they need to throw it, they're going to recognize that very, very quickly and should have a lot of success with that. So I do like Atlanta here laying that massive number. We'll stay in the NFC South for the next one, game number nine on the Super Contest rotation order. And this is the New Orleans Saints. They're a five-point favorite coming out of the bye once again. And, you know, one of the things I've talked about with New Orleans, and it feels like I've been either on them or against them here at some point throughout the season, is that they played an elite defense in week one, an elite offense in week two, lost both of those games, but they've played comparable talent or inferior talent since. They're 2-0 and in those games, and I think the Lions are a very comparable team. You know, Steam drove this number up a little bit. Stafford's banged up. The Lions have some regression to the mean coming from a turnover margin standpoint. They're plus eight right now. Maybe looking ahead to the bye a little bit with so many guys that are hurt. I think everything sets up really well for New Orleans here. We saw the early week steam. We're seeing some late week buyback here on Thursday where the number's down to four and a half across the market. But I think the Saints are the right side here more often than not. You know, the numbers, to me, it's too high. Uh, But for the reasons you mentioned with Stafford being banked up in the situational spot with the New Orleans Saints getting the extra week to prepare off the – off the buy, you know, it probably is about right now once you kind of make a little bit of an adjustment. But my number straight was three. So I'm 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 not going to be jumping at this game. Um, and if I did, you know, I'd probably just be like, well, I hope Stafford's fine and take the dog. Uh, it's, but it's a game that I know a lot of people are, are, are so far liking one side or the other. From anyone I've seen on Twitter or anyone I've talked to about the contest, they're all considering a side in this game. And I've seen both sides being used and discussed. So in my head, it makes me just feel like it's a good stay away spot. So for me, um, I won't end up betting it. And I am curious to see how bad the Stafford injury is. Obviously, if they lost him, I mean, then you're just, or even if he's just playing so hard that he can't be himself, uh, the Saints should absolutely roll. So uh, it's very dependent on Stafford's health. And uh, ultimately, that's what's keeping me off. But it could end up, you know, being uh, paying dividends for you as a Saints backer. Well, and it's kind of interesting because last week, both Buffalo and Cincinnati were top five consensus picks in the traditional super contest. So that's something that we've seen a few times in the past, not all that often, but we have seen both sides of a game show up in the top five consensus. So I don't know if maybe this will be a game that does go in that direction, but yeah. you know, the Saints don't turn the ball over. The Lions are living off of a high turnover margin right now. And also, Detroit just doesn't have a running game to keep Drew Brees off the field. And and even if this Detroit defense is better, and it certainly seems like they're a little bit better than last year, Drew Brees is going to get his. I mean, he's going to go out there and put up some kind of number for this team. Whether or not Matt Stafford is healthy enough to you know, to go toe-to-toe with Drew Brees, I don't really think that that's the case, given what I've seen. Again, I, I wish that this number was a little bit lower. I would certainly be happier with it there. Uh, but I just think from an X's and O's standpoint – the Saints are in pretty good shape here this week. All right, we'll move to a dog. And actually, the remaining three plays on my card are dogs, and they are from some of those games where you've got the smaller lines. I don't know how you're going to feel about this one, Cheetah. I'm kind of curious to get your take on this one. But I like number 18 on the Super Contest card, the Los Angeles Rams. They're coming east to take on the Jacksonville Jaguars, but it is a late kickoff. So I think that kind of neutralizes the bad spot a little bit. Meanwhile, I think Jacksonville's in a very bad spot. They played in London, you know, played the Jets, played Pittsburgh, blew Pittsburgh out on the road. Now they're coming back home. And like I said, I think that the late kickoff really helps the Rams out here a little bit. I know from an X's and O's standpoint, it's not the greatest matchup because the Rams can't stop the run and the Jaguars can only run the football. 
But I trust Wade Phillips here in this Rams staff to have a good game plan this week. Make Blake Bortles beat them, and I don't think he can do it. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, kind of extracurricular drama stuff going on. And one to mention real quick before I transition to this game, another factor for your Saints uh, side, you know, Adrian Peterson, not that he was necessarily a cancer, uh, but obviously wasn't fitting in. It was kind of, you know, yelling at his coach every once in a while. It was noticeable on the sideline. Now, he was traded away now, and I feel like that could only help the Saints at this point. They've been preparing now offensively to not have him. They don't feel like they have to give him six to eight carries just to be happy. And he was, you know, it was like one and a half yards a carry or something. So they're a waste, wasted place. Uh, so he's gone now. So I think that benefits the Saints. Now on the on the flip side here, I kind of think you know, I don't know if you heard this rumor that the Jags would trade a first round pick for Eli Manning and get a a ready now win now type quarterback to go along with their their you know great defense. I think they're number one against the pass. Now, the problem is the Jacksonville defense is dead last in the NFL against the run, which is why everyone was shocked that Le'Veon Bell and Pittsburgh Steelers didn't just run it all through Jacksonville all game long. It was a really weird, weird, I guess, game plan for them and for Haley. Coming off the Baltimore win, maybe they were just in a flat spot, and they you know, they have Kansas City here now. They had on deck who they play this week, so uh, if, if Gurley and the Rams and McVay are, are any smart here, they should be running the ball a ton, Goff obviously had a bad game, threw in a bunch of interceptions against Seattle. Uh, they were moving the ball fine, though, and so I think four of the five were in the red zone or at least inside, like, the Seattle 30. And so, I mean, they, they're they a team that played. They now played Seattle last week, just didn't get the W. You can argue they're, you know, they're a similarly or comparable team to Jacksonville who's in a bad spot, and maybe there's this little rumor hanging over Bortles' head now that Eli Manning trade might happen. And uh, I, I'm never back in Bortles very often. This isn't one, especially. I, mean, I meant to say as a favorite. I bet against them when the Jets were dogs at home, and it panned out. Um, and now here they are, favorites again against a pretty good Rams team. So uh, Rams are definitely one of the ones I've looked at myself. I'm probably going to bet, too, just, you know, in real life, I'm just kind of waiting and hoping that it gets up to three. It's trying to push its way there. It's still two and a half juiced or plus money on a three on the, on the Jags side. So I'm waiting. Hopefully I can get a plus three at minus 110 later in the week on the Rams. I just, I feel like this is one of those games where you kind of want to zig if the market's zagging a little bit, because like I talked about, you know, last week's game against Seattle, for people that just look at final scores, they're going to say, okay, well, the Rams had a chance to prove that they were for real and they failed. They weren't able to do it. They lost that game. You know, against the Seattle team that really hasn't looked all that good so far this year. But like I said, I mean, the Rams outplayed Seattle in that game. It was the turnover margin that really got to them. And I feel like, you know, with the initial move that we saw here this week, and, and I get it. You know, I understand Jacksonville's back at home. They can run the ball. The Rams can't really defend the run. I understand that grab early on in the week, but – I don't think it's the right side to me. I mean, I, I just don't think that the market is right here in this instance with grabbing that early week number. And I think the Rams are a team that's for real. I think the Rams are a legit team. And, you know, this is something I mentioned on Thursday's show, and I, and I want to mention it here as well. We talk about moral victories, and we kind of throw some cold water on them. But to me, with a Rams team that's trying to learn how to win games and trying to figure this thing out, yeah, they didn't win last week, but they outplayed – a really good division rival. And I think that's confidence that they take with them to Florida this week. Yeah, that's a fair, that's a fair point too. I think they, it's, it's interesting all year they've shown up in every game and played like they thought they could win the game. And then they've won some of them too. But even though I think their other loss was against the Redskins, it was a six or seven point game. They were in it. It was tied late in the fourth quarter. I mean, they've played like they expect to win every week, and I think that's a sign of good coaching. And, you know, absolutely, it's not like, you know, you can't take confidence from a loss, especially if you have coaches that are able to, you know, to prep and, and, and then obviously teach you, you know, from week to week. So I think that's a great great point to, to make here as they go to Jacksonville. And one last point I want to make here, and I want to get your thoughts on this a little bit as well. I kind of feel like, and I don't want to take too much away from Jacksonville for that impressive road win, but I think that game shows me that the problems run deeper with Pittsburgh than we originally thought. And I feel like Jacksonville's maybe getting a little bit overvalued for what happened in that game. Yeah, they certainly could. And, you know, time will tell, I guess, when – I mean, Pittsburgh threw – I mean, I think Roethlisberger threw five interceptions himself. There were just a couple of these games where turnovers were going crazy. And, you know, maybe Pittsburgh could come back and beat Kansas City now on the road, and then everyone's saying, oh, well, then who knows – but it definitely seems like something's up. Uh, but defensively, I mean, I think they 
they gave up two touchdowns to the to the Jags defense just with with interceptions. Uh, the Jags didn't really move the ball very well against Pittsburgh. It was going to be a really really low scoring game. Then on the last play of the game before they kneel, uh, Fournette broke a 90 yard run and scored another touchdown. So that was kind of another fluky play right at the end to make the score look even worse. Um, so I'm not I'm not sure. I I, I think you're right. I think I. I uh, it's it's there's the perception of the Jags winning by that much. I think it is playing a role. I'm not sure it's because Pittsburgh's just really bad. I think it was more just the the actual flukiness of the ways the, the Jacksonville uh, team scored and how, how they at least got that many points and why the margin of victory was so high. One other question I want to ask you about for this game here is the Rams play in London next week. They take on the Arizona Cardinals. Is that a detriment to them this week? I mean, you know, because they, they kind of prepared for two weeks away from their families or at least a week and a half until their families joined them in London. Is that something that you would hold against them? Does that factor into the handicap at all for you? You know, I, I haven't necessarily figured out if you're able to quantify the London to and from stuff. I think generally you can kind of get a sense better on the teams going to London based on how they played their last game. Like the Saints Miami one is a pretty good example. I think everyone knew the Saints were just going to kill them, and then they did. The spot was so bad for Miami, and you know in this case I don't, I don't necessarily expect the Rams to be looking ahead to London, especially off of the loss. So you know, maybe had they beat Seattle and you know beat them soundly, like say you know three of the five turnovers led to touchdowns instead, and they win the game by 18 or something, and uh, you know, maybe they are looking a little bit ahead to London, but at this point, I expect McVeigh and, and, and Wade Phillips to have their both sides of the ball ready to play Jacksonville. All right, here's a couple of games that I would classify as leans right now. Since there are only five plays I'm talking about here on the show, I, I've got a fairly decent idea that this is my card, but again, things could change a little bit. However, I'm looking at the Minnesota Vikings here this week. They're a three-point home divisional dog against the Green Bay Packers, and you know, any chance you get to get a good divisional dog with a good defense at home, you know, something that you do want to look at here in the NFL. But for the Vikings this year, I mean, from a statistical standpoint, they're .6 yards per play better than the opposition on the season, and they're only 3-2 and two so far this year. They've outgained the opposition in, three la- in uh, four of their five games this year. You know, Keenum and Bradford, I don't think there's really any kind of difference right now, especially with how we watched Bradford limp around there in that last game. There are some injury problems for the Vikings, namely Bradford and, of course, Dalvin Cook. But the Green Bay team, lots of injuries this year on both the offensive side and the defensive side of the ball. Both offensive tackles have been in and out. Lots of losses in the back seven, some losses on the defensive line. Plus, they're coming off of that late win over Dallas in a game that you know probably meant a little bit more to Green Bay not than this game does, but just one of those non-conference games or non-division games that sort of means a little bit more to somebody. I know it's a short week for Minnesota coming off Monday Night Football, but again, looking at a home division dog here with a really, really good defense, I think I think Minnesota's the right side. You know, you've actually touched now on my three losses last week. I, I was on the Browns, who probably should have covered. I played the Jets. I was on the Rams, and then I was actually on the Cowboys. That was basically just a coin flip, kind of whoever had the ball last game. But uh, Green Bay got me, and Rodgers just does things that are incredible. And no one can can stop the guy, and they've they've looked so good. I, I will say this: this is probably one of my favorite sides too, and I imagine I'll be using it in the contest just because Minnesota. I think it was pretty evident in that Bears game that Sam Bradford, if he's in, he's playing so injured or he's just not good enough anyways at this point where the drop-off to Keenum is, is almost you know non-existent. And Keenum was actually better in the Bears game. As soon as he came in, the offense was moving the ball much, much more efficiently. So I think you almost want Keenum to play the game. If it's Bradford, at least you know they'll have a short leash with him again because they pulled him in the second quarter against Chicago on Monday night. So uh, you know, going home now, by the way, I think this defense is one of the best period. I mean, even the Bears, they scored on the, the fake punt, which was really cool. Uh, I think they they get to 17 points, they scored on the fake punt, so that would have been 10 that was just on the offensive side of the ball. And you know, they actually got a two-point conversion that was pretty cool as well um, against Minnesota. But Minnesota's defense has been just tops in the league for a few weeks in a row, and I I don't care that Green Bay and Aaron Rodgers, this and that, uh, you know, they ran. They went up against the right, so far the worst rush D in the NFL is the Cowboys. You know, rush D efficiency wise, and the Aaron Jones guy blew up as this 
second coming as a running back for the Packers. And now they're playing a Minnesota Vikings D on the road. It's going to be a little bit different, uh, especially when it comes to trying to get the run game going. And we've seen Minnesota play Green Bay really, really well anyways in the past. And they're very good at just taking away the run and saying, all right, Aaron Rodgers beat us. But, you know, in a sense that it's not like Dallas where it's second and 10 on a drive down, what was it, down three or four points. And they were, uh, McCarthy was calling run plays on second and 10 with like 40 seconds left. And they were picking up 20 yards against the Cowboys. I mean, they're not going to be able to do that against the Vikings. So when it comes down to you're going to have to pass and you're playing a much better defense, uh, I'm not so sure that, that Green Bay will be able to have that sort of magic where if they have the ball, the game's over. Uh, and, and so I, I actually like Minnesota's side too. I'm surprised that one shop here in town, it's, it's almost a three and a half. So I'm definitely hoping to get that hook because I missed the opener. It was four and it's basically, you know, cheap threes everywhere else on the Green Bay side. Yet there's one, one place in town, which is actually probably more of a, a square shop. So I might be telling too as far as how much action is being bet on Green Bay versus Minnesota. So I, I do like the Vikings and they'll probably end up making my, my contest card at three. One more game to look at here that's on my lead. And that's game number twenty or team number twenty four here, the Los Angeles Chargers. And they're catching three and a half. Now the problem is we don't have a line to compare to out there in the betting market. So I'm not sure if this is where the line should be. If maybe the line will come out four, four and a half. I don't really know. But I'm expecting Derek Carr to be playing in this game. And truthfully, that doesn't really concern me too much because the Raiders offensive line has just been so bad this year. Chargers have two best pass rushers in the game and Joey Bosa and Melvin Ingram. So they got that first win last week. I think it's a really big one for Anthony Lynn because the longer you go without getting a win, the more urgency there is, the more you know pressure starts to mount, things of that sort. Look, the Chargers' run defense is not very good. They've given up 110 or more rushing yards in all five games. But Oakland can't run the football. I mean, Marshall Lynch is the feature back. It's not working out. The offensive line is just not playing well. Chargers get a pretty bad defense here to try and iron some things out with Phillip Rivers. And also, the Chargers play the Broncos and the Patriots here before the bye. So there's a little bit of extra motivation, a little bit of extra incentive to go out here and play a good game and, and maybe knock off the Raiders. And you know, if nothing else, I've got the protection of the hook there on three and a half. So I think this is the right side here in this game as well. This one's interesting just because we don't know what the lines really are. There's one line yesterday at CG was minus three and it's down to minus two. So I guess the the sentiment is that Carr isn't going to play. For me, the line is really, really short if he plays. Um, now, I maybe haven't adjusted enough for the fact that their offensive line has had tons of issues. And Derek Carr looked so bad for two games even before he got hurt and hurt his back. Um, so for me, it's it's not one I think I could bet because if, say, it's EJ Manuel, everyone's going to be using the Chargers. I'd rather just not use it and hope that everyone's wrong and hope that the you know, Oakland wins by four or more points and you know find another game that I like similarly. If it is Derek Carr, then you're probably going to get, I don't know, personally, I think the number then is, is, is too low. So then I think a lot of people would probably bet Oakland. And so in that case, I wouldn't use the game anyways, and I'd hope for the Chargers to, to cover three and a half. So, um, I, I don't know if I can help you out of that on this one because it's so dependent. I mean, Derek Carr is obviously one of the better quarterbacks in the NFL at this point. It you know has, you know brings at least three four points to the the spread. I think when it, the drop off is EJ Manuel and you know a run game that really hasn't been able to get going, uh, whether it was Carr or EJ Manuel behind center. So I I I can't. I just don't think this one's touchable for me. And it's one of those. If I did anything in real life, it'd probably be betting minus two at CG and hoping card plays and then setting up a middle or something for myself, which I may consider doing. But ultimately, I mean, this is a Derek Carr play or not type line and bet. And uh, I just don't think you can do it unless you, you hear the news maybe uh, come, I guess, Friday night. I'm not sure when you have to get yours in, maybe Saturday morning. Um, you know, they might just wait and, and decide on Sunday and then you're kind of stuck not really knowing. Yeah, that is true. And, and again, I mean, it's it's kind of the risk that you take with looking at a play like that when you don't have a line out there in the market to compare to. But maybe by Friday morning we will, and certainly by Friday afternoon we should. So at least then at that point I can kind of uh, make a determination. And I, I do have until Saturday morning to get mine in. So you know, we'll have to see uh, what does happen with this line. But Sports Cheetah from WagerTalk.com, also doing a lot of great stuff over there at Podcast U. Thank you so much for joining me to break down the Super Contest, man, and I'll talk to you again next week. Yeah, absolutely. Sounds good. Good luck with the Indians going forward, by the way. 
Thanks, man.